Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this instalment, an all-star British cast are a bunch of rotten Romans and some Celts too in Horrible Histories, the movie. In Rome, Claudius, played by Derek Jacobi, is assassinated by his wife Agrippina, played by Kim Cattrall, so that her son Nero, played by Craig Roberts, can be emperor, although Agrippina tries to exert her influence over him. Meanwhile, teenager Atti, played by Sebastian Croft, is punished by Nero by being sent to the Roman troops in Britain, just in time for Boudicca, played by Kate Nash, to unite the Celts in an uprising against the Romans. Atti is captured by teenage Kel, Orla, played by Amelia Jones, who wants to prove herself as a warrior to her father Argus, played by Nick Frost, as events lead to the Battle of Watling Street. The Horrible Histories books are written by Terry Dearly, who actually has a cameo in this film, and he started them in 1993, where they became immediately successful, spawning countless spin-offs and imitations. And one of the major reasons for that is that it wasn't simply factual, it was also very, very funny at the same time. It opened up history to kids who would otherwise ignore it, and also simultaneously was amusing enough that older readers were also checking them out at the same time which added to the series' longevity, and as such, it's actually been adapted to various different mediums, including several for television. There was an animated show, but most successfully in 2009, there was the live-action sketch show, which is respected in its own right, not just by children, but by adults at the same time, who recognised it was very much influenced by things like Monty Python and Blackadder, to the point where, actually, they repackage several episodes of that television show film new links with Stephen Fry and try to aim it at more adult audiences. And so you can understand the thinking of the producer of the television show going, what if we make a movie version of it? What if we make something similar to, say, the Carry On films, which made their own comedy historical epics, including most notoriously Carry On Cleo, where they actually borrowed production value from the leftover set of the Elizabeth Taylor Cleopatra. And so what if we make made a fairly low budget film with a lot of comedians and make it every year or two and put it in time for the school holidays. And clearly that's worked out because Horrible Histories, the movie Rotten Romans, which is a terribly cumbersome title but lets you know they're planning on doing more than one, has actually done quite a bit of bank at the UK box office. It's just a shame then that unfortunately it doesn't really capture the spirit of the source material. One of the big problems with this movie right out of the gate is they don't have the original cast of the TV show who left after its fifth series, and they were a big reason why it was as successful as it was. They weren't just comedians trading roles in the various sketches, they also contributed to that show they wrote for it. So when they left, the show definitely shifted in their absence, and the movie has a lot more in common with the more recent series, and specials than it does with the earlier runs of the show. And it is a shame because that was an enormously talented cast with Matthew Boynton and Simon Farnaby among them, the latter of which actually co-wrote the Paddington films. However, if you do miss that cast, I highly recommend you seek out Bill from 2015, which they all reunited for, and is essentially a horrible histories movie in all but name. It's sketches tied to a loose narrative about Shakespeare and it's all quite clever and very, very witty. It's something that works for both kids and adults. I really do recommend that movie, and it's just a shame they couldn't have brought them back for this one. As I understand it, even if they wanted to, they couldn't, because they were working on their own show, Ghosts, which was tailored for a more adult audience. But because of that absence, you always get the feeling that there's a missing ingredient here, that it's not quite up to the best levels of the television show. And the producer have tried to hide that with a lot of name value. There's a lot of recognisable faces in this film, or at least if you live in the UK, but there's no real camaraderie between them because, frankly, they're barely in it. It's pretty clear that a lot of favours have been called in. Hey, do you have a day to hang out in the woods to be in the Horrible Histories movie? Yeah, sure, and put my name on the poster. And that's probably how that happened, because Horrible Histories has about 12 people top build on it, and about half of them have maybe five minutes of screen time 
less than that in some cases. For example, Warwick Davis gets prominently billed for one scene that lasts all about a minute as a gladiator trainer, and I really like Warwick Davis, but advertising him as starring in it is very, very misleading. And frankly, not enough Warwick Davis is a cinematic crime. Alexander Armstrong at the TV quiz show Pointless also turns up for two scenes and then disappears from the rest of it. There's also comedian Chris Addison who gets top billed for 30 seconds sitting in a tree pretending he's reading a traffic report. Perhaps the most eclectic out of all of them, Derek Jacobi turns up as Claudius, which is a reprisal of his career-making role in the BBC series I, Claudius? and that's a reference that will go not just over the kids' heads, but most of the parents at the same time, because I, Claudius, aired in the 1970s. And the movie ends up falling between two stools, because on the one hand it wants to be the sketch show that it started out as, but it also wants to tell a narrative at the same time. So the way they work around it is that you've got three plots running concurrently, so that when they switch between them, they feel like individual comedy bits, which is a fairly clever way of working around that, but unfortunately, these individual strands just aren't interesting enough in their own right. For example, the storyline with the teenagers, Atty and Orla, the main thrust of the film is also the most boring because it's pretty much there to push the plot along such as it is. And so you've essentially just got these two actors bickering along with each other and that's about it. You can kind of see that the filmmakers want to make an empowering message to young girls in the audience and they focus mostly on Orla and also you've got Boudicca in there as well, but it feels half-hearted at best and honestly, I don't think the two young actors have that much chemistry between them. I think that Sebastian Croft as Atty isn't that good as an actor. He's supposedly a clever, intelligent teenager, and I didn't get that from his performance. I thought he was clumsy and a bit dim-witted, so that really didn't come across. And he's especially shown up when he's right next to Amelia Jones, who is a fairly accomplished child actor. She's appeared in numerous productions in the past. You've probably seen in the David Tennant film, What We Did on a Holiday, and she clearly has a presence about her. I think she's going to go on to much bigger things than this, but she can only do so much with what they've given her, and it plays out in very predictable fashion. You know exactly what's going to happen, what's going to divide their characters going into the third act. Nick Frost also pops up in this plot line as Orla's father, and he's always great value, he's always fun to see, but again, there's only so much you can do with this kind of writing. The other plot line that you have is Boudicca, and Kate Nash clearly is enjoying herself playing that, but they don't really have that many extras. They have to throw on screen all of Boudicca's numbers that she supposedly brought together, and it again plays out mostly in the background, which is a shame because that's the historical part of the movie. If you're going to focus on history, focus on Boudicca as a character. I honestly wish that the plotline with the teenagers was dropped from the film, so you just focus on the two sides of Boudicca and Nero back in Rome. And that subplot between Nero and Agrippina should be a major comedy element in this film, in their fighting for power and position as mother and son. It should be escalating, but instead it fizzles out. A lot of that comes down to the fact that I wasn't a huge fan of Craig Roberts' performance as Nero. I thought it was a little bit too childlike, especially in the scenes where he's conducting his battle plants and he's moving the figurines, making horsey noises as he does so, and he's desperate to prove himself to his mother, but it also feels like a waste of Kim Cattrall, who is clearly very game and is hamming it up as Agrippina, but they maybe had a very limited window of availability with her and the fact they had a quite tight budget. And so once it gets to the point where Nero is plotting to have his mother killed, you would think they would mine that for some good comedy set pieces. I mean, scenarios like they try to drop the ceiling onto her bed to crush her, you could get a great slapstick bit out of that where she manages to avoid it simply by accident. And instead in this movie, 
totally off screen. They just mention it in the dialogue. It feels like a totally wasted opportunity. And then this entire subplot just ends with the biggest shrug I've ever seen. There's no impact to it whatsoever. It just suddenly stops cold. It's just such a blunt way of just disposing of it. And it's such a shame. I think some of this also comes down to the direction of the movie. This film is helmed by Dominic Brigstock, who is a very accomplished TV director. He's worked on Horrible Histories, the TV show, so there is a semblance of continuity here, but he's making his film debut, and it's very, very clear that he's directing it with a televisual eye. It very much looks like a television special, not a movie. When Monty Python moved from the television screen to the big screen with things like Life of Brian, there was definitely a leap in terms of the production value. Not so here. And even the production design looks very much geared for the small screen, which is a kind way of saying it looks cheap. You've got actors running around in togas or wearing plasticky armor, and they're doing so for the most part in the woods, the cheapest possible filming location you can imagine. And so what ended up happening is I was watching this film and thinking, this really does remind me of the no-budget horror movie I was in a few years ago called Nerd Quest, about a bunch of LARPers being tracked by a killer. That's not a flattering comparison, especially when it's blown up onto the big screen. I know they did put a little bit of money behind this. The exteriors of Rome, I believe, are shot in Bulgaria, but other than that, there's no attempt to try and build it up from what you can already access on television. It very much seems geared towards its second life being shown on CBBC. There's no attempt from Brigstock to make it seem more expensive or grandiose than it already is. You would think, given they're trying to make a historical epic, they would actually try to replicate that on screen. But nope, everything is dreadfully, dreadfully flat, and in some cases, actually quite badly staged. You can get away with that on television, definitely not on film. But perhaps the biggest mistake this film makes is that it pushes its historical humour into the background, and that's this series bread and butter. That's the reason why it appeals to all ages. And yes, there are some clever jokes aimed at older viewers, particularly in little fleeting sight gags, but otherwise you can clearly tell this is aimed at much younger children because there is a lot of toilet humour here. Now, don't get me wrong, Horrible Histories has always had gross-out gags. That's part of the appeal because history is grisly and nasty. You can throw buckets of fake blood and decapitations and it still be accessible to children. They love that stuff. But I think that most kids coming out of this movie will mostly just be thinking, man, the Romans had really funny toilet habits because so many of this film's scenes are set in their communal toilets. There's a moment where Sanjeev Bhaskar takes a pee in a pot while he's in a meeting with Nero that goes on for about a minute. Hilarious. Even the plot is instigated by gross-out humour, because Atty, he's trying to collect gladiator sweat in a bottle so he can sell it off, and clearly they didn't deem that gross enough, so he tries to fill the rest of the bottle with horse urine. And yes, there is a shot of a horse taking a whiz that is really quite alarming for what is supposedly a children's film, and then he accidentally sells it to Nero. That's how the plot is set in motion. And when that happens, roughly around 10 minutes in, I kind of knew that it wasn't going to be up to the same level as something like Horrible Histories, the early run of the show, or even Bill. Bill used a lot of historical humour. If you know a lot about Shakespeare, you'll definitely get plenty out of the jokes in that. Whereas in this, they use enough historical basis to string a very basic plot. And that's about it. By the time that Rattus Rattus, the Cincture series puppet, shows up in the closing credits, trying to convince us of, oh, how much this is based on history, how much we've learned about it, I almost felt like going to the screen, is it really? Is it really based on fact? Did we really learn all that much about anything in this? And the answer is, no. Not really. But for my money, the 
absolute nadir of this film is that it's also a musical, and I didn't know that going in. I probably should have suspected, because that's one of the mainstays of the show, is they used to have sing-along songs where they recite historical facts in a way that was very quick, but also amusing at the same time. That's definitely not the case with the songs in the movie that are absolutely dreadful. And trust me, the worst way of finding out that something is a musical is when Boudicca starts rapping, which includes lyrics like, this is a bad romance, and it's driving me gaga, or perhaps the very worst lie of the film, and my hashtag is me too. What? What does that even mean? You're just throwing references into the song just in a vain hope of comedy that will just date the movie horribly and also that last one just feels wildly inappropriate. How does that fit this children's movie? You're trivializing a very serious issue there. I felt genuinely embarrassed for the performers every time they had to break out into song because they're so cringeworthy. Later on, Nero breaks out into a battle rap of his own, and honestly, that one is so badly produced and the lyrics so badly garbled, they have to throw them on screen to make them in any way intelligible. The only compliment that I can give is that when they do a deliberately sentimental romance song between Atti and Orla, at least Lee Mac interrupts it and breaks it off by saying, oh, none of that drippy sentimentality here, please. Yeah, I was on his side, frankly. Those songs really did lower the film dramatically in my estimation, especially because there's no reason for them to be here. They just pad out the film and they are just so awful. Horrible Histories, the movie, really is quite horrid in its own right. Again, if you want a better adaptation of the TV series, go track down Bill, which was very underappreciated on its release and far superior to this, which often feels like a cheap cash grab that has no business being in cinemas because it's barely above what they're already doing on CBBC in the first place. So if you saw this as a Christmas TV special, you'd be a lot more forgiving about it, but people are paying cinema prices for this when it's exactly the same as what they're already doing on television. So when it hits the small screen, yeah, put your kids in front of it. They might be entertained for 90 minutes, but I do think that older viewers will be disappointed about how this film just sells out the wit and intelligence of the earlier run of the show in favour of cheap gags about urine and farting. It really is such a pity. What a letdown. The awkwardly named Horrible Histories, the movie Ross and Romans, tries to expand the franchise to film but fails to capture the spirit of either the books or the acclaimed TV series. In trying to replace the sorely miscast of the show, the film instead has a horde of recognisable British faces but most appear very briefly and clearly only filmed for a day or so in the woods. The movie wants to both replicate the sketch-based comedy of the show while also doing a narrative, but pushes aside most of the property's clever historical-based humour that appeals to all ages in favour of lowbrow toilet humour. Easily the worst part, though, are the utterly wretched musical numbers that are less humorous than they are deeply embarrassing for everyone involved. Fans of the horrible history show would be best advised to track down the far superior Bill instead. If you like this review, then pick up your sword and go over to my Patreon, where you can see my reviews early, among other perks, including access to my Discord server. But until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out.